Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, March 11th, 2010. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, home brewer Sean Terrell joins us to share the results of his starter aeration experiment. What's the best method to get the most yeast growth from your starter? We'll get Sean's take. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm Basic Brewing, all one word. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our show has a Facebook page as well at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we appreciate your support greatly. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. It's been a couple of weeks since I reached into the mailbag, so uh, forgive me if this week's selection seems a bit random. Let's start with Tad, who heard me talk about coleslaw on barbecue sandwiches a couple weeks ago. Tad says, thanks for validating my taste buds. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we always put the slaw on top of the barbecue. Now I live in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and my wife and kids all think I'm nuts when I eat it that way. At least now I'm not crazy. Or at least now I know I'm not crazy, unless we both are, Tad says. (laughs) Thanks, Tad. Don't use me as a benchmark of sanity, by the way. Uh, Then there's this from Brandon in Greenville, South Carolina. P-E-C-A-N. It is pronounced pecan, not pecan. My wife and I argue about this constantly. She's a southern belle from Marion, South Carolina. I was born in Ohio and transplanted here when I was two years old. But I was taught the proper way to speak while growing up and... Coleslaw goes on the barbecue. There is no other way to eat it. Only baked beans go on the side. Thanks for the validation there, Brandon. Now I have to tell you about another thing that uh, may turn off all you non-coleslaw on the sandwich people. Purity Barbecue in Hot Springs, Arkansas, offers a thing they call the Baked Potato Surprise. I may have talked about this on the show before. I don't know. It's a pit baked potato whole baked potato, you cut it open, put a bit of butter in there, your choice of chopped beef, pork, or ham, beans, slaw, and barbecue sauce, all heaped up together on top of it, wrapped in aluminum foil. It's a meal by itself. Man, I'm hungry. (laughs) To get my mind off of that, our friend Douglas uh, Warzynski in Utah is asking for our advice. He's graduating college, congratulations, Douglas, with his law degree and facing the prospect of possibly moving. Douglas says, over the past five years, I've amassed a truly ludicrous amount of gear associated with home brewing. My kettles, burners, fermenters, bottles, flasks, stir plates, chillers, buckets, and an array of dedicated Rubbermaid containers take up the whole western quarter of my basement. With a potential move on the horizon, it occurs to me what a large percentage of my hobby equipment is very fragile. Much of it is made of glass, for example, my collection of large five-gallon glass carboys, or dozens and dozens of small glass bottles of laboratory starter flasks. Even much of the stuff that isn't glass is still fragile for being oddly shaped. For example, my kegerator, which is a modified chest freezer with a wooden collar and a series of taps protruding from the sides, and my kettles and mash tun, each with ball valves that stick out. Knowing that your average moving company employee doesn't always handle another person's personal belongings with the gentle care and love that the item's owner might prefer, Douglas says, I worry how to effectively and efficiently prepare, both in a time and packing material sense, an extensive homebrew collection Uh, equipment collection for uh, a move of up to 2,000 miles executed by hired movers. So what do you think? Have you done this before? you have some advice for Doug Wierzynski to help him move his precious equipment without having a catastrophe? 
Uh, I suggested he give an incentive to the movers. If nothing gets broken in the move, plenty of homebrew will be the reward. How about that? Devin from Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, wrote me saying that he was doing some research on whether beers stored in uh, long term in plastic bottles were at risk of oxidation. Devin says, here's what I found out from Salbro Bottle, a local bottle manufacturer here in Toronto. Devin says their plastic beer bottles will allow for oxidation because the plastic is porous. What you want is a plastic beer bottle of triple layer PET plastic or PET plastic. This is two layers of PET plastic with a layer of ethylene vinyl alcohol sandwiched in between. The other option is a PET bottle that has a metal added to it that prevents oxygen from passing through. Devin says, I I could not find the name of that particular metal, however. Long story short, it comes down to individual manufacturers, and any homebrew store could get theirs locally or from China. I think if anyone is set on using plastic, get the manufacturer's information from your homebrew supplier, call them directly, and ask if the particular bottle you use is prone to oxidation. You may have to go through wholesalers first who provide the bottle to your local store. Uh, Devin says, when in doubt, or if you can't get in touch with the manufacturer, use glass. Or even better, drink your beer faster. (laughs) That's good advice. Thanks, Devin, for that research. Then there's this from Jacob in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Jacob says, I wanted to see if you could plug a local event here in Baton Rouge. The Zaps International Beer Fest will be on March 20th at the LSU Rural Life Museum. Our local Baton Rouge homebrew club, the Redneck, or excuse me, (laughs) the Red Stick Brewmasters. (laughs) Sorry about that, Jacob. The uh, the bat- Baton Rouge, uh, I think, is French for red stick. Uh, the Red Stick Brewmasters will have dozens of brews available. I'll be featuring two extract beers, Sweet Guz's Chocolate Stout, yum, or our 75-minute Hopopotamus IPA. Yum. That sounds great. Red Stick Brewmasters. I need to change my reading glasses prescription. <laughs> uh, I got a lot, lots more to uh, catch up on this week, and uh, or uh, for with email, and I hope to do that next week. Uh, but for now, let's get on to our chat with Sean Terrell. Sean wrote me a while back to uh, tell me he was doing an experiment on the effects of aeration on yeast growth in starters, and you know what I said? I said that's a show. Well, Sean Terrell, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Uh, Thank you, James. It's uh, an honor to be on. Well, uh, we are we're talking about starters today, and before we launch into the uh, the conversation, give us a little background uh, on yourself. All right. Well, uh, I've been home brewing for about six years now. Uh, Started as a freshman in college, actually. Uh, You know, went into college without having a a lot of drinking experience and uh, <laughs> knew that I didn't like beer because uh, at that point, you know, it was uh, natural light Oof. and Bud Light with maybe a, a Heineken or two thrown in for variety. <laughs> um, and actually had a friend whose uh, father is a pretty well-known home brewer um, who I won't name because when we were 19, he was my introduction to good beer. Ah. Uh-huh. And, you know, that first sip of his homebrew, it was a uh, a prickly pear wheat. Ah. Uh, and that was, you know, my eureka moment where I said, oh, my God, beer can be good. <laughs> well, what's the statute of limitations on contributing to the delinquency of a minor? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't looked that up. And, uh, We're not, I'm gonna... not even going to tell you the state. So <laughs> yeah, there you go. We don't want to take any chances. Uh, but you you started homebrewing after that, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Started out with, uh, you know, the kit and a kilo pre-hopped extract. Uh, so made probably two or three batches of pretty mediocre beer. Uh, and then went into extract, did a few partial matches, and then uh, I think my eighth or ninth batch went all grain. Wow. So I've been doing all grain for 
over a little over four years now. And you've also got a science background. Yeah, uh, my degree is in nuclear engineering. Um, so maybe not you know a formal scientific training, but definitely a technical background, and have had the science courses and you know some things that come in handy when when doing experiments like this. Exactly. So you you know how to structure an experiment. That's was <laughs> right. Right. That, that's the bottom line. Or I pretend to at least. <laughs> Well, uh, before we get into your experiment, let's talk about starters. What mm-hmm. What is a starter for those newbies out there? What's a starter, and, and why would you want to make one? Well, a starter is uh, more or less what it sounds like. You want to start your yeast ahead of time before you pitch it into your main batch of beer. So uh, you know, the vast majority of home brewers probably are starting with one of these commercial products, either White Labs or Y Yeast, which have you know, 60, 80, maybe 100 billion cells. Um, And that's really not enough to pitch the amount of yeast that professional brewers have determined over the years is sort of the optimal amount. Um, When we're talking about a five-gallon batch of, you know, at average gravity, 1050, 1055, you need about 200 billion cells. So something like two to three times what you're actually getting out of those commercial products. So in addition to increasing the cell count, there are some other uh, benefits as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, probably the biggest is, you know, if your yeast is alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you've bought, say, a smack pack that came to you through the mail, it might have been exposed to heat or cold. It might be a little old. Uh, if you just throw that in your beer, you're sort of flying blind. You don't know if you actually have viable yeast. Uh, and then the other is that by, make, by having your yeast be as fresh as possible, uh, you will get the most viable yeast, and it'll sort of have a running start when it hits your main batch of beer. And also, you can you can take a, a very small amount of yeast, like the yeast sediment from a Hefeweizen, for example, mm-hmm. and step that up using starters and pitch that and make your own uh, uh, beer with that commercial yeast that's uh, given to you as a sort of a byproduct at the bottom of the bottle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... Uh, not from commercial bottles, but even if you have an old bottle of your own home brew, mm-hmm. uh, that can be a great way to save money, you know, instead of spending 6 or $7 on yeast every time you brew. Now, um, what is the – there are certain methods uh, of uh, making a starter uh, from very low-tech to, you know, fairly ex- expensive equipment and, and high-tech. Uh, run us through kind of some of the, the – basic methods that people use? Okay. Uh, The simplest way to make a starter, essentially, is you're going to make some wort. Uh, So the easiest way is probably to start with dry malt extract. Uh, You know, add that to a little water. Boil it for maybe five or ten minutes. Uh, Basically, you just need to make sure it's sanitary. Uh, Throw it in some sort of vessel. I've used plastic milk jugs, you know, a glass wine bottle, Anything, basically, that you can sanitize, and uh, you add the yeast to that and let it ferment out. You're essentially making a little a little beer. Right. You're making a very small batch of beer, although typically people would not add hops. Right. You can. Some, some people do. Some people add, you know, a couple of pellets in there. Uh, mm-hmm. It may be more for superstition than anything else, but... <laughs> right, and I think there's actually some research out there that suggests that... Uh, Adding hops may inhibit yeast growth. Uh, you know, hops are or were historically added to beer as an antimicrobial agent. So they may actually have an adverse effect on yeast. I don't think there's any consensus on that at the homebrew level, at least. But my advice, at least, would be that adding hops is probably not necessary and could actually be harmful. So what's the recipe that you use for your basic starter? Uh, generally, you want to use anything that will get you a wort with a specific gravity of between, say, 1030 and 1040. So the number that gets thrown around most often, I think, is uh, 100 grams of dry extract per liter of water. Uh, And that'll make a starter with a gravity of about 1037. I found in my experience that if I uh, boil, I think it's a half a cup of dry malt extract in a quart of water for, you know, say, 10 minutes... That that'll that'll get me around ten forty. Does that sound about right? 
oh god i'd have to do the conversion uh, <laughs> i'm pretty used to thinking in metric <laughs> our friends in australia are are, are thumbing their uh, noses at me right now <laughs> uh, <laughs> or something uh, <laughs> well it, and i think in general uh if you can measure your extract by weight uh that's going to be a better way to go about it just because uh you know, with any sort of powder, you know, whether you're measuring sugar or flour in the kitchen, uh, going by volume is not going to be 100 percent consistent. But uh, but I mean, you, you you don't have to be exact in making a starter. Oh, definitely not. Uh, you know, this is a pretty forgiving process and you don't have to have high tech equipment to do this, right? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, essentially, if you can boil a batch of beer, you already have everything you need. So... Uh, I make my starters generally in uh, half-gallon growlers. Um, I see in looking at your experiment, you used gallon jugs. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also get a bit more high-tech. You can use uh, Erlenmeyer flasks. Uh, right. And you can use a stir plate to keep the, uh, the starter agitated. Um, and I guess it leads us into the parameters of your experiment. Um, what were you trying to figure out with your, with your experiment? Well, basically what I wanted to look at was to test some of the conventional wisdom uh, among home brewers about making starters and what the best practices are. Um, I think a lot of home brewers probably when they get started making starters uh, are going to buy one of these kits from a homebrew store, either online or local. Um, which will come with an Erlenmeyer flask, probably a one liter flask, um, a stopper for it, an airlock, and then you know they probably throw in a pound of DME or something like that. Um, and so, just from a theoretical standpoint, I know that yeast need access to oxygen in order to reproduce. So, I assumed, you know, from the outset that using that airlock on the flask is actually going to limit the amount of growth you get. Mm. So, you know, even if these stores aren't implicit, aren't explicitly saying that, you know, you should use this airlock when making your starters, they put it in the kit there, people are just going to use it. Now, what, we, what we're doing with the airlock, though, is we're trying to protect ourselves from infection or contamination. Mm -hmm. So Right. So how do, you, yeah. how do you address that? And you wouldn't want to have your flask or your jug just sitting out on the counter, you know, open to the air. But if we're worried about bacteria or wild yeast coming in from the air, uh, they can't fly. You know, they don't, they don't move on their own will. They have, to, they have to hitch a ride on something like a dust moat or, you know, cat dander if you live in my house. Uh, <laughs> so essentially anything that you can get over the top to be a physical barrier is going to keep your starter sanitary. So what I use is actually just aluminum foil. Uh, you know, it's sanitary enough to use for food right off the roll. So you can just take it off the roll, uh, you know, wrap it loosely over the top of your starter vessel, and you should be good. Now, there's a, there's a product that is sold uh, for this purpose, which is kind of a foam stopper that you put in the top, in the neck of your bottle or the, the, the mouth of your flask, right, that mm -hmm. is, is supposed to let the air transpire back and forth across it and block uh, the nasties from getting in there. Right. Yeah, I've seen those. Uh, my local shop doesn't carry them, and it was one of those situations where, you know, I don't want to spend $8 on shipping to buy a 50-cent product online. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if you have access to one of those, it would def I don't see any reason why it would be any different from using the foil. Um, you know, just from the theory of how diffusion of gases works, uh, as long as you have a macroscopic opening, be it the pores in the sponge or, you know, a gap underneath your foil, you're going to get gas exchange. So what, what are the parameters that we're testing here? We're testing air lock on, foil, mm -hmm. foil cap, and then what else? Right. So we have two different variables. We have whether or not an airlock is used. And then we also have methods of increasing the oxygen in the starter. So we have controls that were just let sit still on the counter. Uh, we have uh, a, a couple of starters that I swirled as frequently as was practical every 10 or 15 minutes. Um, 
and that's to simulate a stir plate. Uh, I've never actually gone to the trouble of building a stir plate or going out and buying one. Um, and actually, after this, I kind of feel justified in that. I probably never will. <laughs> no, no, no. No spoilers. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, but the purpose of a stir plate allegedly is what? Well, there are two reasons given. Uh, one is that by mechanically uh, agitating the starter constantly, you keep the yeast in suspension after the point where they would maybe flocculate out, uh, settle to the bottom naturally. And so they're going to consume, you know, every last molecule of sugar that's available just because you're forcing them to stay active. And the other is that by inducing turbulence in the starter, you're going to increase the oxygen exchange over the surface of the liquid. And also you're knocking out CO2 at right. the same time. Yes. Point. Yeah, good point. So uh, so if you wanted to, uh, to and, and I, I don't have a stir plate myself. I'm, you know, Mr. Low Tech. So uh, whenever I think about it, I come by the starter and I swirl it up and, and uh, you know, the bubbles go out of the airlock and, and uh, I think I'm doing a good job, right? So, uh, so what, are you te- what are you testing here? What was, the, what was the setup? Describe the experiment. Okay. Well, uh, in the first phase of the experiment, uh, I did five starters. Um, since we were just testing some fairly simple parameters, I actually used table sugar uh, instead of using dry malt extract. Uh, and that was pretty much just a cost savings. Um, these were not results that I needed to be directly applicable to brewing. And so getting sort of an order of magnitude result was good enough for me. Uh, so, and then actually I used uh, bread yeast instead of using a, 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 a brewing yeast strain. Mm-hmm. You know, bread yeast is actually genetically very similar to an ale yeast. It's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And so it should behave more or less identically. And we, we've made uh, a batch of, a small batch of beer with bread yeast and is actually pretty tasty. So it does work. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, uh, I tasted a couple of these starters and they were not great, but of course they didn't have any hops in them and they were made from table sugar. So... <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of uh, "quote unquote" country wines, as they say, are you know basically table sugar with uh, you know maybe some dandelion petals or something in there for coloring and, and flavor. So, mm-hmm. you know, people... yeah, and these were actually not undrinkable. Uh, you know, that's maybe not a scientific observation, but <laughs> uh, they actually have a pretty substantial champagne character that really surprised me. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're drinking something like a very dry, sparkling wine. Huh. So we so we've got uh, five uh, batches. Did, have we talked about what those batches were? No, I'm jumping all over the place here. Uh, <laughs> it's probably my fault. I'm derailing you. <laughs> you know, maybe we can get an edit point in here somewhere and uh, <laughs> insert this back there. It's not bad enough yet. We <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what are so, what are uh, five yeah. batches? We do have we have five batches. Uh, we have a control starter that was left alone and used an airlock. We have a control that was left alone, but used foil loosely covering it. Uh, We have an airlock starter that was swirled up frequently. Uh, We have a foil starter that was swirled frequently. And then we have a foil starter that had air uh, mechanically pumped into it using an aquarium pump and air stone, Hmm. which is, uh, I think, pretty much the best thing since sliced bread. (laughs) <laughs> for home brewers, uh, you know, you can get an aquarium pump for probably ten dollars. Uh, mm-hmm. You need to put some sort of filter on it to make sure the air is sanitary, but uh, it's a very inexpensive way to aerate not only starters but your batch of beer. So, how did you prepare uh, the yeast going into uh, the starters? What I did was I just took a packet of dry bread yeast and sprinkled it in dry just directly. I wanted to eliminate every possible variable. Uh, You know, if maybe I rehydrated them, some would be at slightly different temperatures, or maybe, you know, some yeast would stick to the bottom or something like that. So I just sprinkled the yeast in dry. And what was the starting gravity of these samples? There was a little bit of variation. Uh, Let's see, on those first batch of five, the range was 10.6 to 10.8 Play-Doh. 
mm. which is uh, 1.042 to 1.043. So not a tremendous range, but a little bit of variation. Right. And certainly within, you know, anything, any precision that a home brewer would generally be able to achieve. And you also gave some nu- uh, nutrients for the, the yeast as well. Right. What I did was I add, I boiled uh, a couple additional packets of bread yeast to kill off all the yeast and then added those in so that the uh, yeast would have the raw materials available to reproduce. So you, you, you did these uh, experiments in pairs, um, mm-hmm. and you, you set them off, and what did you see? Well, we had a lot of uh, subjective observations and then also some uh, more objective data as well. Um, sort of visually, uh, actually uh, on the experiment page I have a photo of this, there's a really uh, significant difference in appearance between a starter using an airlock and one that uses the foil that's open to the air. Um, you get a lot more croissant on top of the, uh, the foil starter, um, and it's actually composed of finer bubbles. Hmm. Uh, in the airlock starter, you get sort of these big, dense, sort of soapy bubbles, and on the, uh, the one that doesn't use an airlock, you get sort of more what I would think of as a a typical beer croissant, where it's a just sort of a dense cover of really fine bubbles. Now, it would seem to me, just thinking here, uh, that if you had what you had for the first pair, uh, a still starter, a still like not shaken or stirred uh, starter with an airlock and a still starter with a foil over the top, it would seem to me that even in the one with the foil on the top, during fermentation, the CO2 would be building up pressure and pushing out uh, air out of the top, you know, from under the foil. And so it would seem to me that there wouldn't be much of an opportunity for oxygen to come back in. Is that a mm-hmm. bad Is that a bad assumption? I don't know that it's a bad assumption. Uh I think if you look at diffusion theory, that isn't going to be what's happening to any substantial extent. Uh, Anytime you have a macroscopic opening, the partial pressures of the gases will tend towards equilibrium. So even though CO2 is being produced inside this vessel, it's constantly outgassing and all the other gases are constantly flowing in. Hmm. So, and that was one of the things I wanted to test actually. Uh, and in fact, I did see that uh, in the case of the control starters, the ones that were not shaken, uh, the one without an airlock grew about 8% more yeast. So just by taking the airlock off and putting a piece of foil over the top of your starter, you gain 8% right. in yeast growth. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now, what, what was the next pair? So then the next two starters were, again, one airlock and one covered in foil, but these were swirled up uh, vigorously, uh, essentially as often as I could get to them, which uh, <laughs> about every 15 minutes when I was awake and at home. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in the, uh, in the experimental write-up, I actually attempt to quantify this. Uh, let me see, I'm going to quote myself here. To simulate the effects of a stir plate, these starters were agitated in a vigorous circular motion for approximately 15 seconds, approximately every 15 minutes, 12 to 18 hours a day. <laughs> now that's a fun day off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I think actually, when, yeah, when I started doing this, I was unemployed. So <laughs> I, really the genesis of this whole experiment was that I had abundant free time. <laughs> uh, idle hands are the brewer's uh, workshop. I guess. Something like that. <laughs> so what differences did you see uh, in this set? Well, again, we, uh, we saw that the agitated, or I'm sorry, the starter without an airlock produced uh, more yeast. Um, in this case, it was 17% more. More than the... Uh... More than the airlock starter that was agitated. So, 17, so side by side, uh, the shaken, foil-covered 
starter gave 17% more yeast than the shaken airlock one? That's right. Now, how much more would the shaken foil-covered one be than just a still starter with an airlock? Have you got that figured out? Oh, that would be roughly 25%. Wow. So if you ditch the airlock, put a piece of foil over it, and either get a stir plate or shake it whenever you can, you're going to gain 25% more yeast. Right. According to this experiment. Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> now, again, I should say that these are using table sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we get to the DME starters, you know, there's reason to believe that these results may not be directly applicable to a DME starter. Okay. But one other data point that was interesting here is that the shaken airlock covered starter uh, measured exactly the same volume of yeast as the unshaken foil covered starter. Huh. So, in effect, if you do use a stir plate or shaking and an airlock, you're basically handicapping yourself. You're growing the same amount of yeast as a starter that's just sitting out on the counter covered in foil. Ah. Okay. But we're not done yet. Oh, no. <laughs> but wait. Don't answer yet. <laughs> what was the uh, uh, number five or E? Yes. Uh, e for this first round was uh, loosely covered in foil and then had a... Aquarium pump, uh, a syringe air filter, actually two syringe air filters in series, and then just a plastic aquarium air stone that you would get from your, you know, local PetSmart or aquarium shop or whatever. Okay. And what do we, and see? What do we see here? That starter grew slightly less yeast than the, uh, the shaken one, the foil-covered shaken one, but uh, not by a enormous amount, uh, about 5%. Huh. So you actually lost ground with the active aquarium pump aeration. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I believe what's actually happening there is that those results are, you know, being about 5% apart are so similar that, you know, within the error bar on the experiment, uh, we can say that those are more or less statistically identical. So, uh, so when we when we first uh, uh, conversed via email, uh, I looked at the experiment and I said, "Wow, uh, you know that's interesting. How does how does that apply to uh, a, a starter made with uh, malt extract?" And you, I, I believe you said you're already working on that at that time. Yeah, I, I think I had those fermenting at that point already. <laughs> so you were a step ahead of me. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do how do they uh, translate? How did you modify the experiment? with dry malt extract. Okay. Um, before we get into that, uh, I'm going to take a step back, actually, and uh, talk just a little bit about yeast metabolism. Okay. Um, essentially, there are three things that yeast need to reproduce to increase the number of cells in your starter. You need oxygen, which we've already talked about. You need sugar, which is obviously available in your word. And you need the uh, the raw materials that they need to build new yeast cells. Uh, so you can get some of that by adding what I did, you know, essentially dead yeast cells, and they'll scavenge those raw materials. But you also need free amino nitrogen. Um, and this is something that occurs naturally in barley, which is one of the reasons that barley makes such good brewer's wort. Um, and free amino nitrogen is what the yeast use to build the amino acids that they need to make cell walls and DNA and all the cellular compounds to make new yeast cells. And so by making these first round of starters with table sugar, I denied them access to that. And I believe that's why these last two starters produced more or less the same amount of yeast. Uh, we sort of hit that wall hmm. where they simply ran out of nitrogen. And no matter how much oxygen you add, they aren't going to reproduce past that point. I see. So that can now that could also happen in. Uh, a DME or a starter that you made from all grain, but it's going to be orders of magnitude more yeast. Okay. So, uh, with that uh, explanation, <laughs> take us on to, are we ready to move on to the uh, dry malt extract part? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, these last two starters uh, were, again, I guess I've forgotten to mention until now, all of these starters were two liters in volume. 
which is about an average size for a five gallon batch of ale. Um, so these last two starters were made with two liters of water and 215 grams of dry malt extract. So same gravity as the sugar starters. Um, but they grew dramatically more yeast. Hmm. Uh, if we look at, uh, so again, we had one agitated starter and one that was aerated with the aquarium pump. Uh, the agitated starter produced, uh, roughly 320 billion cells compared to 230 billion for the sugar starter. Wow. So, so if nothing else, that's the case for why you don't want to make a starter with table sugar. Right. Um, additionally, there are concerns that the yeast could get used to eating the simple sugars and might not perform well in beer. So we, we have, uh, we're, you compared two more batches of starter, uh, this, mm -hmm. this time with uh, dry malt extract. Right. So which, which uh, methods did you compare? Well, for these two, uh, they were both loosely covered in foil again. And one of them, again, was swirled as often as possible. And the other was aerated with the pump. And the, uh, the swirled, the agitated starter, uh, like I said, 320 billion cells. And then the one that was aerated with the pump, uh, 420 billion cells. Wow. So by moving from just mechanical agitation to the aquarium pump, we get an increase of about 32%. Wow. So uh, that seems pretty significant. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially if you're, you know, if you're brewing a lot, if you're buying dry malt extract to make your starters, you're talking about the difference between spending, you know, two or three dollars on a starter and five dollars. Hmm. So there could be, you know, it could impact your bottom line actually as a brewer. And you, as you're making, taking the time to make the starters, you want to make sure that you're making good starters. You're getting good. Uh, yeast cell increases for all that time as well. Right, absolutely. So how does this compare, how does your results compare to uh, other assumptions and, and published results out there? Well, that's pretty interesting, actually. Uh, my sort of starting point for all of this is the uh, Mr. Multi calculator, um, Jamil Zainashef's uh, website at mrmulti.com. Right where he probably knows as much as it's possible for anyone, any home brewer to know about yeast. <laughs> um, and one of the great tools he has on there for home brewers to use is a calculator that will tell you how many yeast cells you need to brew a particular batch of beer and how big your starter needs to be to, to get that number. Um, but actually, I found when using this uh, aquarium pump that it just it blows those estimates out of the water, actually. Hmm. Well, one of the great things that he does is he breaks down the numbers by a simple starter, you know, just sitting there, uh, one that's mechanically shaken, one that's aerated, and then one on a stir plate, where he has the stir plate as the mechanism that's going to grow the most yeast. And in fact, I found that the opposite was the case, that the aquarium pump grows more yeast than the stir plate. So I guess the, the proof uh, in any experiment is repeat, uh, repeatability. Um, so do you, do you plan on, on doing this again and, and trying to see if you can uh, get the same results again? You know, I don't know that I'll do an actual controlled experiment again. This was just sort of a one-off thing. I do think from now on, at least occasionally, I'll, uh, I'll decant my starters into a graduated cylinder and actually check to get an estimate of the cell counts. That's another thing that's worth mentioning is I'm not actually counting cells here. I'm just measuring the volume of the yeast mm -hmm. and making an assumption about the number of cells per milliliter. But you're using the same measurement technique for each uh, different starter technique that you're using. So you're comparing apples to apples throughout the process. Right, yeah, yeah. There's repeatability in terms of that across all seven starters. And also I'm using the same volume estimates that uh, Jamil quotes on his site. So... What are we to take away from this? I mean, if you're if you're a home brewer listening out there and you skip to the end to see what the nugget of wisdom is, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I hope people don't do, uh, 
what are we to take home from this? Well, I think number one is make a starter. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're brewing a low gravity batch of ale, you know, five gallons at maybe, you know, 1035, 1040, you can probably get away without making one. Um, but to sort of use, to sort of optimize your brewing procedures to do what the pros do, you need to be making starters. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually we have, I'll sort of plug myself here for a second. We're, uh, in the process of doing another experiment that's going to survey, uh, hopefully a couple dozen home brewers, uh, essentially asking the questions that you asked in your, uh, yeast pitching rate experiment. Yeah. And we, I look forward to, uh, uh, hopefully taking part in that as well. And oh yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely be sending you a couple of samples, but, uh, yeah, essentially asking the question is just throwing a smack pack into a five gallon batch going to have a, going to be significantly different from building a starter. But uh, so beyond just make a starter, uh, what advice would you give homebrewers out there on the method that's best to make a starter? Well, I would say, uh, you know, use a calculator, you know, use the Mr. Multi calculator or uh, Y East has one on their website. Uh, try to make the starter, you know, the appropriate size for the beer you want to make. Um, and, you know, as part of your method of doing that, you can try, you know, a method of adding more oxygen. Um, you know, definitely get rid of the airlock if you've been using one. Uh, if you have a stir plate or want to build one or buy one, uh, you know, that's probably a great technique. Uh, an aquarium pump is definitely going to be beneficial and, you know, also comes in very handy for aerating the beer itself. So... I think, you know, for 10 to $15, an aquarium pump is probably one of the better investments a home brewer could make. Mm -hmm. Well, very nice. Uh, it's an interesting experiment, and I'll put a link to uh, the, the page on your blog with the, uh, the photos and the charts and all the details of the method. Um, and it's, it's got me thinking that uh, I need to go out and buy an aquarium pump in an inline filter and, uh, you know, give it a shot, see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I guess the number one conclusion is, uh, don't take anything on faith, especially not anything I'm telling you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've only been doing this for a few years, but, uh, you know, experiment for yourself and see what works for you and what gives you the best results. Well, there you go. Anything else for the cause? Uh, I'm about finished with my glass of porter, so uh, <laughs> I think that must wrap it up. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, James. Well, thanks again to Sean. Look for a link to his blog entry on this experiment in the description of this episode at basicbrewingradio.com. Will the methods he describes make a difference in your brewing? Only one way to find out. Put them to the test yourself. I know I plan to. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. We're still sending out our 2010 Brewer's Logbooks along with our Reinheitsgebot is a four-letter word shirts on our shop as well. Check out our home brewing DVDs, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. And uh, if you go to our site, you can find combo deals to save you a couple of bucks. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are The Zombie Survival Guide, Complete Protection from the Living Dead. And Ontel Turbo Snake. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we definitely appreciate your support. And uh, don't forget, you can also subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine and become a member of the Homebrewers Association, the American Homebrewers Association, through our associate links as well. 
That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson down in Austin, Texas. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.